and welcome to St Ninian's Church in Stonehouse. I'm Stuart and I get to be the minister here. This week we're going to be thinking a bit more about a word that we've come across already. The word is witness. What does it mean to be one? So as we come together from wherever we are, and even whenever we are because we all watch or listen at different times, we come to do something really special. We join together to share our hopes and our dreams, our fears and our sorrows and to give witness to God's presence in all of that with us. So let's hear a story about the start of the journey for four of the first witnesses. Let's hear from Mark's story of Jesus. Blake is going to read to us from chapter 1 verses 14 to 20. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has came near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Like many people, I have sometimes fallen down the internet rabbit hole of TED Talks, If you know what a TED Talk is, then you're probably nodding and smiling and recalling hours listening to talks about things you didn't even know were a thing and being utterly enthralled. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then TED is a conference where speakers are invited to talk for no more than 18 minutes about the thing that they're most passionate about. These talks are available at TED.com. And as well now as the main TED conference in California each year, they're are TEDx conferences, so that people can put their own local TED conference on, so that even more people can have the experience of listening to someone share their passion. One of the talks is by J.J. Abrams. He's the writer and director and producer of films like Star Wars, Star Trek, and my own guilty favourite, Armageddon. In his talk, J.J. talks about the process of writing and how he feels intimidated by the empty page. I know how he feels. I get the same feeling every week. But for me, it goes much further than that. I've got an A4 notebook that I got for Christmas years ago. It's beautiful and I've never written in it. I'm terrified to write in it in case I ruin it. What if I make a mistake? What if I write the wrong thing? What if what I write isn't very good? Like many of you, I spent most of Wednesday afternoon watching a country I'm not a citizen of far, far away from here, where a man and a woman that I've never met were being sworn in as President and Vice President of the United States of America, and another man that I've never met left office. I watched on as an interested bystander, a witness, if you like, interested to see how would it all work in these COVID times, and if it would go off without incident. I watched with millions of others as one man left in a fanfare of self-aggrandizement that only confirmed a sad smallness, and the other one went to church. And as I watched on, interested to see what everyone would wear, who would turn up and who wouldn't, how good the performers would be, but mostly just to be a a witness to history, to see a new president take office, to hear what he had to say, and to see the glass ceiling shattered as the first woman and first person of colour to hold the office of vice president was sworn in. And to be able to say in years to come, yes, I saw that happen. And for the record, Lady Gaga nailed the national anthem. And J-Lo and Garth Brooks were just fine. And there was a lot of purple being worn. And there were words. Lots and lots of words. I like words. I like speeches. I think the world needs more moments where words are spoken that stir our hearts and set our minds racing with the possibilities of how the world could be a better place for all of us. Inaugural addresses have in the past been such moments and if nothing else it would be nice to hear complete sentences from an American president again. President Biden's inaugural address 
really did hit the spot. He spoke with clarity and passion. He gave hope and ambition and stern warning in good measure. It was a good speech. But the new president and vice president and all the rest were outshone by a 23-year-old black woman in a bright yellow coat and a red hairband. Her name is Amanda Gorman, and the recital of her poem, The Hill We Climb, was the most remarkable moment. There on the steps of the Capitol, where just a few days earlier a, a mob had tried to halt the transition of power and in large measure tried to deny her the right to even be part of America. She stood there with remarkable confidence, sharing the deepest of insights into the soul of her country and in many ways into the heart of what it means to be human. It was astonishing in the way that I think only moments filled with well-crafted words can be. There in front of four presidents and three vice presidents, the leaders of the Senate, the justices of the Supreme Court, as she said, a skinny black girl raised by a single mom told the truth. She bore witness to all that America is and was and what it could be. She named the problems, she confessed the wrongs, but also her faith. She gave all of us hope that things can and will be better if only we have the courage to stand up and to try. For there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we are brave enough to be it. But it's times like these that make me want to step away from the keyboard, from the blank screen and, and cause me not to write in my pristine notebook. What could I ever say that would measure up to that? I might as well just not bother. And some of you, I'm sure, would be quite glad if I didn't. But I think in some way you all know what I mean. I'm afraid. How can I even hope to live up to that kind of standard? Where would I start? What if people don't like it? It's safer just to step away. I think a journey as followers of Jesus can be a bit like that. If I'm intimidated by a poet halfway around the world, then what hope have I got when I look at Jesus? How could I ever live up to the standard that he sets? And then I read this story of four very ordinary men who are invited by Jesus to follow him. They're fishermen, working with their fathers when Jesus invites them to go and see something else. They're just normal people. But that's not where our story today starts though, is it? After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. After John was put in prison. John was put in prison by the political powers of the day for telling the truth, for naming the problems. And here's Jesus doing exactly the same thing. Repent and believe the good news is the same message that John preached. And it got him locked up. And here he is saying, come and see. Leave your security and your predictability and your assumptions about the world and the way that it is and what's possible and come and see something else. Watch and learn. Come and witness what's about to happen. And witnessing is important, but there's a risk. Witnesses expose their part in the proceedings. There's a famous philosophical question that comes from the idea of witness. If a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it still make a noise? There's another version of that which asks if a man speaks his mind and there's no woman there to hear it, is he still wrong? The second one, I think, is a joke. Maybe. Or perhaps it's a way of reinforcing the dominance of men and the undermining of the role of women through the use of language. Either way, both questions ask something about witness. If there's nobody there to see it or hear it, no witnesses, how can we know that it happened? We need to be very careful about what we think Jesus calls Andrew and Simon and James and John to. Because that call, like most calls, changes and develops over time. But Jesus' initial invitation is pretty simple. All Andrew and Simon and James and John are asked to be are witnesses. Jesus doesn't call them or us to be him. He invites them and us to come and see and to be seen and to tell others about what we've witnessed. Witnesses have a hugely important place in our world. Science 
is the witnessing of how things work. News is the witnessing of events. The legal system is founded on the idea that witnesses tell the truth. Art is the witnessing of the human condition. Jesus' ministry is an act of witness, telling and showing people about God and how it's possible to live a different way. Imagine Jesus had just kept all of that to himself. Mark's gospel itself is an act of witness. Mark writes down what happened, reporting the good news, not just so that we can read about it, but as an invitation to us to come and meet Jesus, to bring the kingdom of God ever closer. That needs people to tell of what they've seen and to invite people to come and see for themselves. And the church, we've given a name to that and the world has started to use that word as evangelist. It just means someone who tells the good news, someone who bears witness to what they've experienced. The disciples bear witness to what they saw Jesus do, but they also tell of what God has done in their own lives. And this, I think, is important. The invitation they offer is not an invitation to come and see someone else who will tell you about God. They don't invite people to come to their church or to listen to their minister. They invite people to come and see God, the God that they've met. They invite people to meet the risen Christ. When we rave about a book or an album or a restaurant, we don't suggest that people should go and read a review of it. We tell them to go and read it or listen to it or eat there for themselves. Our only hesitation might be that they might not like it as much as we have, or they might think that we're odd for liking it in the first place. Church is great, it's brilliant. It's it's so good that you tune in each week. But all that happens here, though, is whoever's speaking gives witness, gives their testimony to what God has done. This isn't the thing. This is just a review of a thing. All I can tell you is what I've seen. Perhaps give you some insight into what others have seen and how that's made a difference to them and to me. But it's not the thing. You meeting Jesus, that's the thing. And people are much more likely to take up that invitation if it comes from someone they know and trust, someone like you. But we're afraid. Amanda Gorman read every poem and every speech from every inauguration before she started to write down her own poem. Rather than being intimidated or scared to write her own fresh page, because, well, she could never live up to what had come before, she embraced all of it learned from all of it, let it fill her and inspire her, and then she trusted that her own words would be enough. You have to go and meet Jesus for yourself. You can listen to people talk and read all the books that have ever been written, but you have to come and see for yourself and then tell other people what you have seen. Our witness is our invitation to come and see someone amazing, someone who changes us, gives us the strength to try to be better and who picks us up when we fall down, dusts us off and sets us off on the road again. It can be comfortable to sit in the dark. It's easy to hide away our faith. It's much less risky just to keep quiet. But the world will never change that way. Things will never get better that way. The plight of the poor will never improve. The cause of hunger will never be tackled. Wars will never end. The climate will never be repaired. The displaced will never find a home. It needs us to stand up and stand out. As Amanda Gorman testified, it's time to step out of the darkness and be seen. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there's always light, if only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it.
loving God, we know that when your Son, Jesus Christ, came into the world as one of us, he trod upon hard places. He felt the strain of this world, the pressures, and he suffered just as we do. We come to you now asking for your help in keeping us strong, keeping us healthy in body, mind and spirit. In these few moments of silence, we pray for those in our own family or circle of friends who are in need of your healing touch for their hurting hearts and minds. We pray that they be open to and willing to let you heal those hearts, for you are the Lord who heals all. We thank you, Lord, that because you created us, you know our inner thoughts. You know all of our fears, our hopes and our dreams. You know our past, present and future. You know all of our emotional needs. We thank you that you are the source of health in our inner being. For we know that when we draw close to you, you add your strength to ours. You help us cope. You guide us, you comfort us, you strengthen us. We pray that you will continue to develop in us the qualities that create emotional wellness. We pray that you will renew our mind daily and keep our thought process clear. Help guard us against negativity and worry. We pray that you will help us handle our emotions well and we thank you that you understand our feelings and that you hurt when we hurt, and you rejoice when we rejoice. Guide us to use and express our emotions in appropriate and healthy ways. Comfort us when we are hurting. Calm us when we are distressed and anxious. Heal us when we are broken. Alert us when we are overreacting. Prevent us from acting before we think. Loving God, when we are overcome with negative emotions to the point that they are interfering with our lives. Guide us to seek help from others and to be open to receive that help from those who extend kindness, care and compassion. Show us how to handle stress. Guide us how to keep our life balanced. Open our eyes to activities that can replenish our mind and spirit. Connect us with others in meaningful ways Deepen our friendships, strengthen our family ties, connect us with other Christians. Show us your purpose for a life that we might be part of something bigger, something more than ourselves. Give us vision, hope and promise. Never let our hearts grow old. Keep us moving from glory to glory in your kingdom. Help us care for our bodies and keep it strong. Help us to eat well and keep fit. But most of all, draw us closer to you. Fill us with faith, trust, love, grace and peace. And the knowledge that we are safe and secure in you today, tomorrow and always. Lord, you have called us personally by name just as you called your first disciples, Simon, Andrew, James and John. Help us to believe your word and follow you faithfully. Fill us with the joy of the gospel that your light may shine through us in our words and in our actions to others. This is even more important now during this pandemic as we face having to support and help one another with little or no physical contact. Hear our prayers, Lord, as we pray together the word you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever. Amen. Called by God to follow, the time has come to go into the world and make God known to all we meet. And as we do, may God guide our path. 
May Jesus walk beside us and may the Holy Spirit inspire us today, tomorrow and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.